All right, we are at 10 minutes after the hour, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to our second lecture of the day. My name is Yi. I'm one of the UCSF residents, and I'll be moderating this session, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Hanno from Stanford University down the street, who will be talking to us about interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome. Thank you, Yi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking to you. I'm going to discuss ICBPS and concentrate on diagnosis and office management and give you a little bit of the history and some of the current controversies regarding this syndrome. And let's see if I can move the slide here. It's not letting me um, advance the slide. -y. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, there could be a button on the bottom left. Then oh, okay, there, right? I see. Okay, thank you very much. So let's start with the definition. The, the, the problem, the disease was described in the early 1800s, but it was popularized by Guy Hunter at Johns Hopkins as a peculiar form of bladder ulceration whose diagnosis depends ultimately on its resistance to all ordinary forms of treatment in patients with frequency and bladder symptoms or spasms. So it was essentially patients with what we now call a Hunter lesion, which is not a true ulcer in the bladder, but rather a vulnus or a weakness in the wall of the bladder that cracks and bleed as the, bleeds as the bladder is distended. And this was a very defined um, circumscript definition of the syndrome. In 1949, J.R. Hand described small, discrete submucosal hemorrhages and dot-like bleeding points uh, associated with this syndrome. And Anthony Walsh in the 1978 uh, Campbell's Urology coined this glomerulations. And this was also used uh, and found to be fairly common in patients with bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis. Now the whole field really changed in 1978, when at Stanford, um, Stamey and Ed Messing, who was one of Tom Stamey's residents, wrote up a paper that became extremely influential and described nonspecific and highly subjective symptoms of around the clock, frequency, urgency, and pain, somewhat relieved by voiding when associated with glomerulations under bladder distension under anesthesia. So now the definition encompassed patients with symptoms and either glomerulations or Hunter lesions. So this left out a giant number of patients who did not have Hunter lesion or glomerulations who had the exact same symptoms. And it caused, there was a lot of confusion related to this definition, but it certainly gave people something to hang their hat on. And this became very popular, this definition. So there was a lot of confusion. This is around the time in 1985 when patient organizations began to be formed regarding interstitial cystitis. And the biggest one was the Interstitial Cystitis Association. And in 1986, I went on Good Morning America with Vicki Ratner, who was the head of the Interstitial Cystitis Association. And we made an appearance that lasted about six minutes. And they received 10,000 letters from people all over the country uh, who had symptoms of this problem. So it was apparent that this was not a rare disorder, but this was something that many people were suffering with, and this caught the NIDDK's attention. And the NIH organized a meeting the following year in 1987 in order to standardize the definition of this disorder uh, and enable uh, researchers around the world to define a group of patients that everyone would agree had symptoms and indeed had bladder pain syndrome interstitial cystitis. So they define these research parameters. They were never meant to be a de facto definition for the clinician. There was actually no requirement for pain in the initial NIDDK criteria. And there was a huge void at the time. So a lot of clinicians all over the world started using these as the definition or criteria necessary for diagnosis 
of interstitial cystitis. This is not what they were meant to, to do. Around that same time in 1987, there was a very prescient paper published by Magnus Fall in Gothenburg, Sweden, regarding interstitial cystitis that no one paid a lot of attention to, but it turned out to be extremely important. And in this paper, he said that Hunter lesion disease should not be evaluated with non-Hunter disease in clinical studies. These were two different problems entirely, but nobody really paid attention to that paper 33 years ago. So the NIDDK uh, meeting that we held in 1987 was followed by a, a long research effort funded by NIDDK. The first five years, 1993 to 1997, they just studied the patients who met the criteria for the NIDDK and they studied patients with the symptoms who did not meet those criteria to try and get some baseline information. The next 10 years, were involved in looking for a magic bullet, some treatment that would cure this disease. And out of millions of dollars and 10 years of research efforts, the only real positive finding there was that pelvic floor physical therapy should be a keystone in the treatment. Other than that, no drugs or other treatments were identified uh, that could be uh, specifically uh, recommended. And then in 2008 to the present time, the NADDK went back to basics. They established the multidisciplinary approach to the study of chronic pelvic pain or the MAP and got broader input from pain physicians, rheumatologists, GI doctors, clinicians, basic scientists in order to uh, further this disease. So what did we discover when we started looking at this and from the uh, NIDDK database that was formed, the first thing we did was look at the NIDDK criteria and we found out that lo and behold, they did what they were supposed to do. 85% of patients who met the criteria, everyone agreed, had interstitial cystitis at that time. But they missed a full 60% of patients who everyone felt had interstitial cystitis who did not fulfill the criteria. So this showed that you cannot use the NIDDK criteria to diagnose the disease. It's only helpful for research studies, and it really changed the way people started to think about the so-called NIDDK criteria or definition of interstitial cystitis splatter pain syndrome. After uh, waiting for many years for the literature to accumulate, the AUA in 2008 finally came out with a guideline on ICBPS, and this defined the disease as, or the syndrome, I should call it a syndrome, not a disease, as an unpleasant sensation, pain, pressure, discomfort, perceived to be related to the urinary bladder, associated with lower urinary tract symptoms of more than six weeks duration in the absence of infection or other identifiable causes. There was no requirement for Hunter lesion or glomerulation. And this was very important because it became a symptomatic syndrome. And the reason we chose six weeks rather than three months or six months is we didn't want to leave patients without a diagnosis who were miserable and make them wait for three months or more to uh, get a diagnosis and be able to start on some kind of a treatment. So the diagnosis is one of exclusion in patients who meet the definition. And this can make what can appear to be a, a complicated uh, situation relatively straightforward. Confusable diseases as the cause of the symptoms must be excluded. Further documentation and classification of BPS might be performed according to findings at cystoscopy and morphologic findings in bladder biopsies and the presence of other organ symptoms as well as cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and sexual symptoms should be addressed. Now, there are numerous confusable diseases. Some of them are listed here, ketamine cystitis, radiation cystitis, urinary tract infection, bladder stones. Uh, but most of these can be easily eliminated fairly quickly by doing uh, a relatively limited evaluation. First, the history. You want to ask for the duration of symptoms. 
negative urine culture, make sure it's not an infection. The number of voids per day should be at least eight to make this diagnosis. The location, character, and severity of pain, pressure, or discomfort should be documented. The presence of dyspareunia, dysuria, ejaculatory pain in men, and the relationship of pain to menstruation in women. O'Leary SANT symptom and problem questionnaires should be used to establish a baseline for seeing whether your treatment is responsive or the patients are responding to treatment. And finally, asking the patient to characterize their pain on a visual analog scale or a numerical rating scale uh, can be helpful along with body maps. Ex exactly where do you appreciate the pain? In terms of examination, abdominal and pelvic exam focusing on areas of tenderness and trigger points. Pelvic support should be documented, a focused evaluation to rule out vaginitis, urethritis, urethral diverticulum, a brief neurologic examination. Ultrasound post void residual is very important. And then what about additional studies? Well, obviously a urinalysis and urine culture are necessary. Cystoscopy and urodynamic testing are optional unless the diagnosis is in doubt. So if you suspect bladder cancer, vesicle stones, urethral diverticula, intravesical foreign bodies, that would be an indication for cystoscopy. Certainly anyone with microscopic hematuria needs a standard hematuria evaluation. And then urodynamics can be useful for suspicion of outlet obstruction, poor detrusor contractility, and to explain why patients are initially refractory if you've tried your first line therapy and it hasn't been helpful. And thus, you can rule out the confusable diseases and leave bladder pain syndrome as a diagnosis of exclusion, which is what it is in essence. Now, it turns out this is not quite as simple as it sounds. Myofascial pelvic pain can actually cause the symptoms of bladder pain syndrome and be a confounding disorder, or it can be secondary to bladder pain. When you're in pain, when your pelvis is giving you a lot of uh, pain signals, it's very hard to relax the pelvic floor. And when you don't relax the pelvic floor, you start to get pain from the consistent uh, muscle contraction you experience, and it becomes a vicious cycle. So this is something that's not quite as easy to diagnose or determine. And another uh, confounding issue is overactive bladder, and that can be difficult to differentiate. There are a subset of overactive bladder patients who have pain in or outside the pelvis, and this is where urodynamics can be helpful. And I see more patients who have been mistakenly diagnosed with overactive bladder by their primary physicians who end up having a diagnosis of BPS, so it's a very common issue. And the key question that I ask everybody is, what is driving you to seek a toilet? If, if there were no toilet available, how would you feel? Would you be primarily having a lot of pain, discomfort, pressure? Is that, what, is that what is driving you to empty the bladder? Or is it that you feel like you're going to suddenly wet yourself if you don't find a toilet? And that question can be very revealing and uh, important. Now, what causes this uh, syndrome? Well, the short answer is nobody really knows. It may be immune-mediated autoimmune disorders, primary neurogenic inflammation, infection, bladder trauma, a genetic predisposition, may be involved with regional and widespread pain syndromes. I've seen patients who will get a urinary tract infection and then they're never the same, despite the fact that the urine is sterile. I've seen patients who've been on an airplane, couldn't empty their bladder because they couldn't get to the bathroom. Their bladder gets over distended and they develop this symptomatology. So any insult to the bladder can cause it. We think that there are, uh, there's mast cell activation, histamine release, changes in urothelial permeability, C-fiber activation, and then immunogenic and allergic responses. You get a vicious cycle with progressive injury and then the pain can uh, sometimes, after several years, become centralized. And then no matter what you do with the bladder, the pain is not going to get better. It can result in regional pain syndromes, 
And there may be an entirely unique pathogenesis for Hunter lesion disease. Um, no one knows what it is, but that's, uh, that's a theoretical uh, issue at the present time. And that uh, segues into phenotyping ICBPS, which is a major area of controversy at the present time. Now, regardless of what we call it or how we define it, phenotyping may hold the key to improving treatment outcomes and facilitating research in bladder pain syndrome. And the only proven phenotype in 2020 is the Hunter lesion, which is what defined this disease 100 years ago. There are only a few anecdotal examples of a non-Hunter lesion patient assuming the Hunter lesion phenotype. And this patient population seems to be different than non-Hunter patients. They're different histologically. Hunter lesion is an inflammatory disorder. Inflammation is prominent. There's epithelial denudation and a pancystitis. Non-Hunter lesion bladder pain syndrome may have mild chronic inflammation on biopsy and 50% of the time biopsies are completely normal and there's no inflammation in the bladder or it's very scarce and the epithelium is preserved. Looking at these two different groups of patients, the mean age of onset of Hunter lesion is 41 to 55 years. It's in older patients. Non-Hunter lesion is 30 to 42 years of age. If you give Hunter lesion patients cyclosporin, 80% or more of them may respond. If you give cyclosporin to non-Hunter lesion patients, the response rate is way less than 30%. Hunter lesion patients respond to full duration of the lesions, resection of the lesions, steroid injection into the lesions. These uh, modalities are not helpful for non-Hunter lesion BPS. Pathology is distinct for the Hunter lesion. It's variable and may be normal in the non-Hunter lesion patient. <clears throat> there are fewer comorbid conditions in patients with Hunter lesions. In patients with non-Hunter lesion disease, you'll often elicit a history of irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, migraine headaches. Uh, there is a genetic predisposition to panic disorders. It's a much more widespread uh, pain condition than Hunter lesion. And Hunter lesion patients have a lower anatomic bladder capacity under sedation. And non-Hunter lesion patients often will have a normal anatomic bladder capacity. So basically, it's kind of interesting. We've come full circle. We diagnosed the disease initially in 1915 as patients with symptoms and a Hunter lesion. The diagnosis was opened to patients with glomerulations in 1978 by Messing and Stamey. In 2011, actually in 2008, we dropped the requirement for glomerulations or Hunter lesions and said, if you have these symptoms, you have bladder pain syndrome. The new name came about around 2008 to 2011. And now we're coming back to the idea that Hunter lesion is a phenotype and maybe a disease in and of itself as it was in 1915. And glomerulations, which we thought were very important, turn out to not be important at all and we no longer use them in making a diagnosis. And in fact, I'm sure you've all seen glomerulations in patients with bladder cancer, in patients who are cystoscoped with uh, no significant urologic problems. And uh, they're missing in a lot of patients who have bladder pain syndrome. So we no longer rely on glomerulations at all, even though they make for very pretty pictures. And more and more literature now is reflecting these ideas. Uh, we believe a Hunter lesion IC is a distinct disease from non-Hunter lesion IC and therapy should focus on the bladder. Technology should be developed to refer separately, terminology rather, to refer separately to ICBPS with Hunter lesions. And as Magnus Fall just wrote in a paper coming out in the Scandinavian journal uh, in the next month, 33 years after his initial paper, it's time to accept that classic IC with Hunter lesions and BPS always should be evaluated separately in science as well as in clinical routine. 
So what you see here is a Venn diagram from the International Consultation on Incontinence, where we have actually pulled Hunter lesion outside of bladder pain syndrome and regard it as a separate problem entirely. Now this is not in accepted throughout the community, the medical community, but I think it's coming and I think it makes a lot of, of sense. So let's move on and look at prevalence. Numerous studies show that if you use the O'Leary Sant questionnaire to screen populations worldwide, no matter what country you look at, the prevalence is about 300 per 100,000. So that's a number that I kind of hang my hat on. The Rand Corporation did a big study uh, in the United States, and I think UCSF was involved in it, and a lot of uh, so several urologists were involved in the study. And this was a population, a, te a telephone-based survey, and they found very high numbers of patients had symptoms compatible with di this diagnosis. In the population, 2.7% of adult women and 1.9% of adult men had these symptoms with the majority never diagnosed uh, with any disorder. And it, the prevalence in men is actually higher than that for chronic pelvic pain syndrome, non-bacterial prostatitis. So I think a lot of men who've been diagnosed with prostatitis, if you strictly diagnose them by the definition of ICBPS, they would fall into that category. Now, how common is Hunter lesion disease? Well, this chart comes out of the new edition of Campbell's. And we used to think Hunter lesion was very rare, but if you look at all of the papers published all over the world, it turns out that you find Hunter lesions in about 34% of patients who've undergone cystoscopy under sedation. This number may be in the 15 to 20% bracket in the United States and up to 50% in Europe, but nevertheless, keep your eye out for Hunter lesions because they're much more common than we ever thought. And you can diagnose them if you look carefully just doing a local cystoscopy. You see a stellate scar in the bladder. At present, there is no biomarker with high selectivity and sensitivity suitable for, differenti for a differential diagnosis of BPSIC from other uh, diseases. Why is this? Well, there's heterogeneity of the underlying mechanisms of BPS and a variability in the diagnostic criteria. And you know, we just haven't found a good biomarker yet. That will make life a lot easier when we do. The FDA recently distributed a draft guidance based on an expert uh, meeting that they had a year and a half ago. Uh, on interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome to establish, uh, to guide drug companies in treatments, uh, designing treatments for uh, this disease and to guide industry in general. And this meeting that they held uh, did not have a lot of urologists in it and some of the findings were kind of questionable. And this was the resulting guidance which resulted, uh, came out of this meeting. This is a draft, there are, uh, there's time now for people to write in and change this guidance before it becomes official later this year, and I hope that they will. But right now the FDA says clinical trials should not exclude patients based on the description of their symptoms. Well, if you're gonna try and phenotype these patients, that doesn't really, is not a very helpful guidance. Also, they say ideally treatments intended for ICBPS should improve both bladder pain and discomfort and lower urinary tract symptoms. Well, I think it should be that they can improve one or the other, both would be great, but they shouldn't be dismissed if they just help one side of this equation. They also said randomized controlled treatment duration uh, trials should be at least six months. Well, six months is very long for a placebo controlled trial for any disease, let alone a pain syndrome, so I don't think that's gonna make it easy to recruit patients and I don't think that's gonna actually be doable in real life. And finally, there was no guidance to suggest patients with and without Hunter lesion should be studied separately. So personally, I have a lot of problems with the FDA guidance, but it is only a draft at this point and hopefully it will change as they get comments from uh, 
informed people around the country. So these are all difficult issues to contend with. Is BPS best looked at as a syndrome, an end stage response of the bladder to what may be many causes or diseases? There's a wide range of responses to therapy and natural history. It's really a collection of symptoms is the way to look at it. Is Hunter lesion best looked at as a disease, clinically indistinguishable from BPS, but it does not evolve from BPS. It has a distinct appearance, histology, and a distinct response to many therapies. And finally, should BPS and IC be differentiated in all pharmaceutical trials? Viewed as one entity, we have failed to find convincing responses to a variety of attempted therapies in decades of research trials. The use of local cystoscopy makes differentiation practical and inexpensive, so the new guidelines coming up should ultimately reflect this change in thinking, and Hunter lesion patients should be regarded, I think, as having a separate disorder. So let's turn now to the AOA guidelines and start with conservative therapy and look at its place within the guidelines and what do the guidelines actually say? Well, in terms of diagnosis, cystoscopy and urodynamic testing are appropriate when after the basic assessment, the diagnosis remains in doubt. Hematuria, incontinence, overactive bladder, gastrointestinal symptoms, gynecologic symptoms, pyuria, et cetera, would warrant doing these studies. The potassium sensitivity test should not be used as a diagnostic tool in clinical practice, and that's where you instill high concentration of potassium in the bladder, and if the patient is in terrible pain, then it's a positive test. It can flare the symptoms, and its outcome changes neither management nor the treatment approach. There are a lot of false positives, false negatives. It's really a pretty worthless test, so no one Hardly anyone does it anymore. Hunter lesion is a positive finding that can confirm the diagnosis in patients who meet the definition criteria. In its acute phase, it's an inflamed, friable, denuded area. In its chronic phase, it's blanched and non-bleeding, and it can provide a therapeutic option with fulguration or steroid injection, cauterization, uh, resection, et cetera. Glomerulations, the finding of glomerulations on hydrodistension is variable and not consistent with clinical presentation. Absence of, glomer of glomerulation can lead to false negative assessment of patients who present with clinical findings consistent with ICBPS, so we no longer use glomerulations. <clears throat> In terms of principles of management, multiple simultaneous treatments may be considered if it's in the best interest of the patient. Reassessment to document efficacy is essential. My personal bias is to use one treatment at a time. If the patient gets benefit but is not good enough, you can add another treatment. If they don't get benefit, you remove it and put something else in its place. Continuously assess pain management for effectiveness. Consider a multidisciplinary approach if necessary. And reconsider the diagnosis if there's no improvement despite multiple treatment approaches. Begin with more conservative therapies, reserving more aggressive therapies for inadequate control of symptoms. Surgery other than fulguration of a Hunter lesion should be reserved for end-stage small fibrotic bladders or when more conservative measures have been exhausted and the quality of life is poor. The initial therapy type and level depend on symptom severity, clinician judgment, and patient preference. This is a disease where the patient really decides how they want to handle it and what they want to do. You don't want to fight with the patient about how to manage it. You want to let the patient guide you, but educate them as best you can. Ineffective treatment should be stopped once a clinically meaningful interval has elapsed. Now these points I think are very important. Given the natural history, an initial conservative treatment approach can make sense. Half of all ICBPS patients may exhibit symptom improvement with time with or without regular follow-up and receiving a new treatment. So half of these patients are going to experience improvement in their symptoms over time. Symptom duration is associated with more severe symptoms only in limited populations. 
Symptom duration is not associated with chronic overlapping pain conditions or mental health comorbidities. To the extent we can prevent catastrophizing, we can expect less in the way of long-term pain symptoms. So this is why you don't wanna jump on everybody with the, the kitchen sink when they first come into your office. You wanna let the natural history of this disorder play in your favor. <clears throat> and then if you do everything at once, you subject the patients to a lot of invasive therapies with a lot of side effects that may not be necessary. First step is education, review the normal bladder function, the ICBPS knowledge base, the risks and burdens of available treatments, and the potential need to try multiple therapeutic options over time. Behavioral modifications that can improve symptoms should be discussed and implemented as feasible. Stress management is very important. Help the patient improve their coping skills and manage stress-induced symptom exacerbations. This is not in the guideline, but this is some of the things that I do. I recommend Tums when they have symptom flares because Tums can alkalinize the urine. I tell them to avoid food or beverage triggers. I don't recommend strict ICBPS diets, but I do tell them about some foods that are triggers that can be triggers in some patients. That would be alcohol, hot spicy foods, caffeinated beverages, um, tomato-based products, citrus. These can all trigger symptoms in certain patients. If you find a trigger, it makes sense to avoid that food if it's something you love, you can try Preleaf, which helps to prevent foods from irritating the bladder. It was invented by the same person who invented Lactate and Bino, a very bright food scientist in uh, New Jersey. And uh, I think it's quite worthwhile. I recommend Quercetin to a lot of patients to try. It's over the counter. It's available in products like CystaQ, BladderQ, ProstaQ, it's a plant pigment, a potent antioxidant flavonoid, found mostly in onions, grapes, berries, cherries, broccoli, citrus fruits. It's a versatile antioxidant. It can possess uh, protective abilities against tissue injury induced by various drug toxicities. There's not a whole lot in the literature about it, but there are a couple of uh, studies that suggest its value. More recently, uh, Palmitoyl ethyl enolamoid, or however you pronounce that, has been recommended uh, in several papers published in Italy. This is available over the counter and on Amazon, has a protective role in a rat model of cytoxan cystitis. And uh, in one study, an open label study of 32 patients, it reduced pain, O'Leary SANT scores, PUF scores, urinary frequency, bladder capacity was improved. It's something worth trying, and all of these kind of things buy you time to let the disease get better on its own. And, um, uh, you know, never minimize the placebo effect as well in any disorder, especially something like this. Second line treatments, manual physical therapy. This was the biggest thing to come out of the NIDDK so far. If you have appropriately trained clinicians available, Maneuvers that resolve pelvic, abdominal, and or hip muscular trigger points uh, can be very helpful. Uh, connective tissue restrictions, avoid, you want to avoid Kegel exercises and pelvic floor strengthening exercises that can make the symptoms worse. One of the keys to physical therapy is thiel massage. Thiel massage is a particular method of massage to the posterior pelvic floor muscles including coccygeus. The finger is moved laterally in contact with the soft tissues of coccygeus. Levator ani, gluteus maximus muscles moved with moderate pressure. It's not an effective option as a monotreatment modality for non-hunter lesion BPSIC, but it should be integrated in a multidisciplinary approach. But it's very useful and probably as good as any oral therapy that we have. Second-line treatments in the AUA guideline, amitriptyline, cimetidine, hydroxazine, pentosan polysulfate, or intravesical therapy if the patient chooses that. And the only approved intravesical therapies in the US, the only approved uh, treatment uh, intravesically is DMSO. It's often given with heparin, lidocaine, and other uh, pharmaceutical agents. The only two approved drugs for IC period or pentosan polysulfate and DMSO.
everything else is off label. So there are various sites of actions for oral medication. We'll look at this uh, for a second before uh, I lose that slide. Antihistamines are supposed to stabilize mast cells, inhibit histamine release and mast cell degranulation. Pentosan polysulfate is sort of uh, a, ga it's a gag replacement. It's like Pepto-Bismol. It's supposed to coat the bladder like Pepto-Bismol coats the stomach. Amitriptyline is a, involved with pharmacological neuromodulation via serotonergic pathways, both centrally and peripherally. Gabapentin inhibits neural upregulation and neurogenic spinal cord inflammation. So these are some of the things you can try. Now, amitriptyline is probably right now the number one drug around the world used for bladder pain syndrome. We first wrote about it in 1987 when I had a patient who had depression, who was seen by their psychiatrist. Their psychiatrist put them on amitriptyline. They had severe IC and their IC symptoms just kind of melted away. And then we found uh, a couple of other patients like this. We tried it. It seemed to be quite effective, even at low doses. Arndt van Ophevin in Germany uh, did a controlled trial with some long-term follow-up that found it to be extremely useful. And it, when you look at the pharmacology of amitriptyline, it, it looks like a really a perfect drug for this kind of a problem. It increases serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain in a specific ratio that potentiates the effects of the brain, of the body's own endorphins. So it potentiates the body's own narcotics and works as an analgesic. It acts as a beta-3 agonist that can improve bladder capacity. It has anticholinergic effects. It has sedative effects that help people sleep at night. It stabilizes mast cells <clears throat> and has antihistaminic effects more than any other tricyclic uh, antidepressant. So it does a lot that you would want a drug to do. The NIDDK studied it in a very large multi-center trial, 271 patients. All of the patients were treatment naive and in an intent to treat analysis, it did not quite beat placebo, 55% to 45%, probably because all of these patients also got standardized uh, education behavioral modification program that may have overshadowed the addition of the drug since all of them were treatment naive at the start of the study. However, if you looked at patients who got on a dose of 50 milligrams of amitriptyline who could tolerate the drug, then they did have a significant improvement over placebo. And the conclusion was that if you can get up to 50 milligrams, and in some patients much lower, uh, you can get significant benefits from low-dose amitriptyline. So it has long-term safety and efficacy. There's a statistically significant amelioration of BPS symptoms. It does have side effects, and almost a third of patients don't tolerate the drug generally because of sedation during the day. Uh, dry mouth, constipation, increased appetite can also be side effects, but sedation would seem to be the number one. Uh, paradoxically, if the patient's up all night voiding, they may sleep better and be less tired on the medicine. You wanna use it with caution in elderly patients, patients with cardiac disease, patients with a history of arrhythmia, and anyone who is a significant suicide risk uh, amitriptyline can be fatal if uh, taken in overdose and there's really no way to reverse it. Recommendation is start at 10 milligrams a night, titrate it once a week or even every two weeks to get a ceiling of 50 milligrams a night, no higher than that. Or you can stop at a lower dose if the benefits outweigh the side effects at a lower dose. Now let's look at Elmeron, the only approved oral medication. It's a synthetic polysaccharide. So uro, it coats the urothelium, replenishes the GAG layer, the glycosaminoglycan layer. You have decreased urothelial adherence with this, decreased histamine release. In, in supposedly, supposedly, it improves the urothelial barrier. Um, so it does a lot of things you would want. There's a good story about it. These were the two pivotal trials that got it approved. It passed a very low bar. The bar was greater than 25% global improvement. 
<clears throat> so luckily for the company, the placebo uh, rate of improvement in the pivotal studies was only about 13% to 15%. The drug helped about 28 to 30%, which is what you would expect a placebo to do. And the only objective finding was an increase of 20 cc's in the average voided volume. So that's about a tablespoon. But nevertheless, it's got the drug approved. The FDA uh, put it out on the market, 100 milligrams three times daily, has a latency of up to 11 months. So it can take almost a year of treatment to see any benefit. Generally, they say three months. Only 4% of a dose is excreted in the urine. So it's hard to see how this would coat the bladder when only 4% of a dose is in the urine. Has side effects are relatively minimal, 4% chance of alopecia and a 10% chance of nausea and diarrhea. So because the data was so scant for approval, the FDA mandated two phase four trials. The first one was a dosing trial. So they took the standard dose of 300 milligrams, increased it to 600 milligrams in a cohort, and then 900 milligrams in another cohort, and treated patients for six months. And there was absolutely no dose response. Side effects increased with dosage, but efficacy did not. So you always want to be a little bit suspicious of any drug when there is no dose response. So then they did a second phase four trial with uh, down dosing of the drug, 300 milligrams in one cohort, 100 milligrams in a second cohort, and placebo in a third cohort. This was also a six month trial, 369 patients. And as you can see here, time to first response of 30% or greater reduction from baseline in the interstitial cystitis symptom index. There was no difference in any of the groups and the study was terminated early. So it really doesn't look like, uh, uh, like Elmeron is an effective uh, drug. In addition now, starting with a group of ophthalmology group at Emory a few years ago, they discovered a novel and possibly avoidable maculopathy, pigmentary maculopathy associated with chronic exposure to PPS. They looked at 36 female patients taking PPS regularly. Median duration of exposure was 186 months and 16% had pigmentary maculopathy, giving them prominent symptoms of difficulty reading and prolonged dark adaptation. And this was a, a kind of a frightening side effect to pick up in these patients. And since then, there have been numerous studies showing this association of macular disease with long-term use of pentosan polysulfate. <clears throat> and, uh, even in patients after discontinuation of the drug, there's a case report of progressive maculopathy. So the first, I just read about the first uh, legal uh, lawsuit regarding this now, and I think there's gonna end up needing to be a, a black box warning or something, we'll see what happens. But given the uh, low efficacy of the drug and this new side effect of the drug, I think it's going to uh, weigh on practitioners in terms of whether or not they prescribe it. Antihistamines were initially described for use in this syndrome in 1961 by Simmons, who postulated that intravesical histamine release may cause the IC symptoms. Theo Harides popularized hydroxyzine, which blocks neuronal activity of mast cells. It's given in a dose of 50 to 75 milligrams. Sedation is the main side effect. It's inexpensive and well tolerated. There's never been a placebo controlled trial showing it's beneficial, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's something you could uh, try in these patients. Uh, it's an anxiolytic and it can also help them sleep as well. There was a paper from China on low dose sildenafil, a randomized double blind uh, placebo controlled trial, uh, 24 patients in each group, 25 milligrams daily for 12 weeks. And this did show a benefit in the interstitial cystitis symptoms index and problem index. So it may be something that's worth looking at. There's a similar study that was going to be presented at the AUA this year. It was accepted 
on low dose tadalafil, and it also seemed to be uh, have some benefit in these patients. So something to consider. Of course, it's a very expensive drug, uh, and I don't know how many patients would want to give it a, a long-term try, but something worthwhile looking at. Gabapentin is an analgesic, anxiolytic, anticonvulsant, used 300 milligrams to 2,400 milligrams a day. It inhibits neural upregulation and neurogenic spinal cord inflammation. It's approved for seizures, chronic neuropathic pain. Has a lot of side effects, some of which overlap with amitriptyline. So you want to be careful if you're using that uh, with amitriptyline. <clears throat> and it has to be titrated because of its sedation. Then we come to, uh, you'll see simetidine in several of the uh, guidelines for interstitial cystitis. There have been a couple very small trials in England showing potential benefit. There's no reason why simetidine should be effective and it's never caught on and there's never been any large scale trials showing benefit. So I, I don't know anybody who uses it, but it's something you will see. So finally, in the AOA guideline, third line treatment, uh, cystoscopy hydrodistension under anesthesia can give you relief that can last for a month or two, uh, up to three or four months, and in rare cases, six to 12 months. So don't forget about the old fashioned cystohydrodistension in these patients, even in those who don't have a Hunter lesion. And certainly if they have a Hunter lesion, the treatment should be full duration or resection, full duration is what most people do now uh, with laser or uh, with or without laser. Triamcinolone injection into the lesion is also very helpful. Botox, if the patient is willing to self-catheterize for days or weeks after the injection, Botox is certainly a very uh, good treatment in about 60% of patients, maybe even a little bit higher. If you limit the injection to the trigone, you get similar results as injecting throughout the bladder and less of a chance of incomplete bladder emptying following the injection. And 100 units uh, in 10 unit aliquots is what you need. Fourth line treatment, <clears throat> uh, neurostimulation, interstim. I have not been very happy with results from interstim in general, but uh, it can be beneficial, especially in patients where frequency is the main uh, cause of symptoms rather than pain. It's, it's not quite as effective for pain. Something to consider, uh, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation uh, works in a similar fashion, and that's something you could try before you go into interstim, although there's not much in the way of literature on PTNS for uh, bladder pain syndrome. Cyclosporin A is a very effective treatment for patients with Hunter lesions who no longer respond to full duration. It's administered orally, has a lot of potential side effects involving uh, kidney hypertension, uh, liver, possibility of lymphoma. So you wanna be careful when you use it, you have to monitor blood levels, but um, it can be uh, very effective. If you stop the drug, the symptoms come back and the inflammation returns. There are numerous papers on cyclosporin. Most of the data originally came out of Finland. Uh, they had an 85% success rate in Hunter lesion patients. Success rates in non-Hunter lesion patients have been uh, in the 30% range. Uh, John Forrest in Oklahoma wrote a paper uh, showing this, but he had about a 70% success rate overall with most of the patients succeeding who had Hunter lesions. So I would say, this is definitely worth considering in patients with Hunter lesions who don't respond to full duration. Certainly something to consider before you're doing major surgery. And finally, major surgery can be undertaken in carefully selected patients for whom all other therapies have failed to provide adequate symptom control and quality of life. If someone has a very small bladder capacity right off the bat under anesthesia, less than 200 ml, and uh, they opt for surgery, that's also reasonable. You don't have to go through the whole litany of treatments we've described if their bladder capacity is minimal. I personally like just a simple ileal conduit urinary diversion. 
You don't have to do any further operations after that. You don't have to take out the bladder. If they opt for a, a neo bladder or a pouch, they have to realize that months or years later, they may get pain in the pouch and require a conversion to a diversion. These are the AUA guidelines put together as you'll find on the website of the AUA. And in the future, we look for changes in the guidelines. I think the AUA right now has a guideline committee preparing new guidelines. Hopefully there'll be a separate guideline for bladder pain syndrome and Hunter lesion disease. Phenotyping will be based on the latest data. Bladder capacity would be another area where phenotyping is probably important. Bladder capacity under anesthesia. Flexible cystoscopy, I believe, should be mandatory early in the evaluation. And uh, sodium pentosan polysulfate, Emron, there should be a long-term uh, caution on use of this drug for more than you know, a year or two. And if it were up to me, I'd probably take it out of the guideline altogether. So that's, that's the uh, story. I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Hanno, for a wonderful talk. I think an under-lectured topic in resident training. So we're very glad to have it. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, one question regarding uh, the guidelines uh, all refer to pain management as an option. So what do you see as the role of pain management? Is there a step in your protocol where you refer them? And how do you counsel patients on what to expect from pain? Uh, that's a good question. We, we really do not like to use narcotics in this disease if we can help it. We can't always help it. Um, <clears throat> but once you've got a patient on chronic narcotics, for whatever reason, none of the other treatments seem to be very effective. So I, I try not to do that. And I've had a couple of patients where I've had to I had to put them on narcotics early in my career who died on narcotics, either from unintentional or intentional overdoses. I think they were unintentional. But that being the case, I always will refer to pain management if I think a patient is at the point where they're going to need long-term narcotic treatment. I don't do it myself. Um, I think that I rely on the, the pain management services for uh, nerve blocks, for that kind of thing, for this, for some of the patients who will go on gabapentin, I'll send them to pain management. They require a lot of time to match. When you get to the point where none of your therapies are working and you're looking at chronic pain management as the essence of your treatment, uh, I would prefer to have them seen by, uh, we have a very good pain management service at Stanford, I know a lot of places do, and my recommendation would be to send them there if pain is the primary problem and you're not gonna be able to affect the disease by treating the um, bladder itself. Great, uh, a question about pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, do you feel that in a patient with a normal exam and a non-tender pelvic floor, would you then recommend pelvic floor physical therapy? Uh, that's a good question. And based on my experience with that NIDDK trial comparing physical therapy, pelvic floor physical therapy with California massage, <clears throat> where they showed the benefit of the pelvic floor physical therapy. The urologists were each asked to make a decision as to whether they thought the patient had an abnormal pelvic floor, and then they sent them all to the physical therapist, and the urologists were horrible in making that determination. So <clears throat> I send them all to physical therapy and let them decide whether or not they need physical therapy, and the vast majority end up getting physical therapy. So. I mean, I think it's very helpful, even if you don't feel that they have a very high tone pelvic floor. Uh, I think it's very useful. So, <clears throat> but that's NIDD case study convinced me that we're not the experts in that. Great. Uh, there's a couple of questions about sort of your uh, initial combination and counseling uh, in your personal practice for first time uh, patients that come to see you. Yeah, I start conservatively, talk to them about exercise, stress reduction, warm tub baths, I think are very helpful if they have a bathtub at home. A lot of people don't anymore. But sitting in a warm tub for 15 or 20 minutes a night, uh, you want to empower the patient. You want to give them things to do. Quercetin, I routinely uh, talk about. Preleaf, um, Tums to alkalinize the urine. Motrin, if you're having a flare. Uh, 
uh, trying to regulate your fluid intake so the urine is not so concentrated that it's painful, but not so dilute that you're peeing every 15 minutes. Um, I'll probably organize physical therapy right off the bat or very soon. And start with that, Quer uh, talking about quercetin. After that, PEA is something I've just recently put in. But after that, I will go to low-dose amitriptyline. If they don't respond to the initial conservative management, I have no hesitation in the majority of patients with going to low-dose amitriptyline, provided they don't have significant cardiac disease or a history of arrhythmia. Um, but I'll use it even in patients in their 70s if their symptoms warrant. Uh, because at these low doses, I think it's probably safe. Great. Um, do you have any thoughts on the use of uh, medical marijuana as a treatment to alleviate symptoms? Yes, uh, that has not been well studied. I, I sometimes suggest patients to try it, and a lot of my patients do use it. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't really know enough about that to, to make a, a recommendation. I know Don Abrams at UCSF is uh, one of the world experts on that, and uh, I would defer to those people. Great. There's a question about um, the fact that urinary diversion can provide relief of symptoms without actually removing the bladder. So have you heard of any trialing of bilateral nephrostomy tubes as a test of relief before doing the diversion? Yeah, well, that's interesting because I've had patients who were miserable. They were younger and they didn't want to, and they failed everything. And I would just put in a cope catheter in the bladder. It's that tiny little catheter that curls in the bladder doesn't seem to irritate the bladder mucosa. And I've had patients managed with that for, you know, a couple of years, just by diverting urine out of the bladder through the bladder that feel better. So the bladder doesn't distend, they have a little stopcock on it. I'm not putting that out as an official recommendation, but sometimes you're strapped for what to do next. So yeah, I think diverting urine from the bladder is the key. Great. Uh, there's a question about the increasing interest in studying the microbiome in these patients. Um, and we we're wondering what your thoughts were about the evidence so far. And do you think this will help define new phenotypes in interstitial cystitis? So, uh, so far, the evidence that this, that this is related to the microbiome is very limited. Um, all of these patients have been on numerous courses of antibiotics because their symptoms are those of infection. So I think that alters the microbiome. And I, I'm never really sure of what the information that we're getting means just because these aren't normal patients. Um, and whether the changes in the microbiome are primary or secondary. So I think it deserves further study. But at this point in time, there is no evidence that I see is an infectious disorder uh, and that treatment with antibiotics or a variety of antibiotics or whatever makes any difference in the symptoms. Great. There's a question about uh, immunosuppressives. So it's interesting that cyclosporin A is helpful. Are there any studies on intravesicular immunosuppressive administration of agents that you've heard of? Um, yes, there, there's uh, a urologist in uh, India who uses intravesical tacrolimus um, and he's reported pretty good results, but there hasn't been a really good a tight controlled trial showing benefit. Um, I think that intravesical route is very interesting for bladder pain syndrome. And uh, I think that is gonna be the future of treatment. And a lot of pharma companies are working on that right now, but I don't know of anything that's close to being ready to go. Great, and a question about sort of how you exclude chronic prostatitis as a possible cause of the pain and how you sort of manage that in your yeah. workup. I think that the patients who have, it's almost like you know it when you see it, the patients who have prostatitis complain mostly of pain. It's a kind of a dull, aching, perineal pain that comes and goes. Um, they don't really have the lower urinary tract symptoms. But I, I would say that you can make this an easy distinction if they meet the diagnosis. If you look at the AUA definition of IC and you have a prostatitis patient who meets that definition, they have IC, they have BPS. 
whether or not they have a prostate problem or a pelvic floor problem in addition, because I think most prostatitis is really pelvic floor. And you can, I recommend Rodney Anderson's book, A Headache in the Pelvis. That, that becomes neither here nor there. I mean, the treatments are rather, uh, some of the treatments are kind of similar, but I think if they meet the definition of the AUA for ICBPS, that's what they have. That's how I do it. Excellent. And I think we have time for one more question. The other questions will be answered on the website. Um, let's see. The, this is a question about your treatment algorithm in pregnant patients okay. with ICBPS. Yeah. There's only one paper on pregnancy and um, IC. Uh, so there's very little information that's been published on it. Um, Deb Erickson has a paper in one of the uh, journals on that. You can look it up. But it's really a matter of working in conjunction with their obstetrician and avoiding any treatments that are potentially problematic. There's no magic stuff to do. Uh, the, you, what you do is, you, in pregnancy, you hope that the patient gets a remission because the majority of patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding will experience improvement of their symptoms because of the hormonal changes of pregnancy. So that's what I rely on. And then just standard conservative measures that um, are agreed upon by their obstetrician, but we don't use medications. None of the medications are so incredibly successful that it's worth any level of risk with the fetus. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have, but thank you so much again for a great talk. Um, and we'll be posting the, the answers and the slides and the video. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.